computer screen, no? which we probably all seen. It's this device where you have uh, uh, some balls of equal size that are hanging from strings, and then you pull one of them, you release it, and then it kicks the others, they move a little bit, and then the last one picks up the momentum and shoots off. So somehow, uh, th this describes also the behavior of eigenvalues. So let's see, this is work done with uh, Achim Kampf. Okay, so the essence of uh, this work is trying to answer the question what, of what happens when we add two Hamiltonians. So in the following sense, um, let's say that you know the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of some Hamiltonian H0. Okay, and then you also know the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of another Hamiltonian H prime. It's still complicated to know the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of H0 plus H prime. And this is a typical situation that we find in physics. You start off with some free Hamiltonian, you add an interaction Hamiltonian to it, and then you're in trouble because you need to find the new eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Okay, so typically, because we don't know how to solve that problem fully, we approach it perturbatively. There are some non-perturbative results, like the Wigner von Neumann result on level repulsion, Cauchy interlacing, and Wilde's inequalities. Um, and here today I will tell you about a new number to the result. So what we do here is we simplify the problem by instead of adding a full interaction Hamiltonian to our free Hamiltonian, we add a rank one projector to it. So that's a rank one projector multiplied by a real number of mu. That's the coupling constant. And if we know the answer to the question of what happens to the eigenvalues and eigenvectors when we add a rank one projector, we can iteratively build a full interaction Hamiltonian by adding one by one projector. Okay, so let's let's solve this problem. So the setup is that you know the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the free Hamiltonian S0, and then you're wondering what happens to the new eigenvalues. How how do they move as we change the coupling constant here? We know trivially from the trace trace of uh, of this uh, operator. We know that uh, the change and we know that the derivative of the trace with respect to the coupling constant is 1, it's greater than 0, but what about the derivative of each of the individual eigenvalues? Is it greater than 0, less than 0? Is, does it depend on the eigenvalue? Well, here, I'll show you that the, the answer is that all of them move in the same direction. And uh, here's a non particularly formula that proves that that is so. And um, we, what this shows is that is that generically, when we add a, one, a rank 1 projector to a Hamiltonian, we get this Newton's cradle behavior of uh, eigenvalues. And that means that as you change the coupling constant mu from minus infinity to plus infinity, what happens is that this lowest eigenvalue shoots up from minus infinity, then it kicks these other eigenvalues at some finite value uh, of coupling constant mu, and then the largest eigenvalue picks up the momentum and shoots off to plus infinity. This is the generic behavior, because generically the overlap between the projector and the eigenvector is non-zero. Okay. And so here you'll see the animation of this behavior with where I just chose four eigenvalues randomly. So you can see that visually it reminds us of Newton's Creedle. Uh, another uh, interesting result that we have is that we can express the new eigenvectors after we add the rank 1 projector. We can express the new eigenvectors in terms of the old eigenvectors. That's this formula here. Uh, what this formula tells you is that if s, some real number s, is the eigenvalue of this uh, operator, well, the corresponding eigenvector can be calculated exactly in terms of the old eigenvectors. Um, another uh, property of uh, Newton's cradle spectra is that when you take a union, when you take the union over all of the spectra, over all of the coupling constant mu, you cover the real line exactly once. Uh, and that's interesting for sampling theory, which I'll talk about uh, later, hopefully. Uh, but one, uh, one particular uh, thing you can do with this is that, let's say you start out with some spectrum, S1, S2, etc. But you don't like the spectrum, you'd like uh, a real number s to be in, in your spectrum. So you add a rank 1 projector. What coupling constant to mu do you need to choose in order to achieve uh, eigenvalue s? Well, we have a formula which tells you exactly. 
So you choose the new eigenvalue s, and I tell you which coupling constant you need to add. Okay, and this is how it looks on our plot. Here you can see how, as you change the, the coupling constant from minus infinity to plus infinity, how the spectrum evolves. Uh, one special piece of Newton's cradle spectra is Cauchy's interlacing theorem. This is an old theorem because it's named after Cauchy. Uh, what this theorem tells you is if you start out with some uh, n by n self-adjoint matrix, which has its own eigenvalues, in this case s1, s2, s3, s4, and then you cross out a row and a column, you, you make it this way you make a new matrix, which has its own eigenvalues. The Cauchy interlacing theorem tells you that the, new, that the new eigenvalues, the prime ones, interlace the old eigenvalues. And here, uh, using our formulas, we can, we can see what's going on here. Basically, when we send the coupling constant mu to plus infinity, or minus infinity, it doesn't matter, then the subspace corresponding to the projector V uh, just decouples from the Hilbert space. And then what you do in this formula, you say mu is equal to infinity, and then you get the formula which tells you uh, what the Cauchy interlaced eigenvalues are. And those are the, exactly these asymptotes that the spectrum approaches as you send the coupling constant to infinity. Uh, yes? What happens if the eigenvalues are degenerate? Okay, uh, I won't talk about that, but uh, there's uh, analog, I mean, there's similar things happening. Basically, if you have two degenerate eigenvalues, uh, one of them will not move, the other will move, and uh, which part of the subspace uh, will move is chosen by the projector that you have. Thank you. No problem. Okay, uh, there's a similar construction also for unitary operators. Uh, so, you, uh, as before, we started with some free Hamiltonian, let's say S0. Here we start uh, with a unitary matrix, U0, whose eigenvalues and eigenvectors we know. But then to achieve the Newton's cradle behavior, instead of adding a rank 1 projector, we act multiplicatively on the matrix U0. Basically, what we do is we add a phase to a subspace of the Hilbert space corresponding to the vector W. And then uh, we get a similar behavior, only this time, of course, because it's a unitary matrix, the eigenvalues live on the unit circle. So uh, what's going to happen here is that this eigenvalue is going to move here, this one here, and so on, and all of them are going to move in the same direction. Okay. In this parameter, alpha goes from 0 to 2 pi. Uh, and uh, these two Newton's cradles are connected using the, uh, related by Cayley transform. This is the formula for Cayley transform and its inverse. Uh, and it's very simple if you think of it in terms of the eigenvalues, it's just a Mobius transform for the eigenvalues, which relates to the real line to the unit circle in the complex plane. And here you can see the formula that relates um, explicitly the coupling constant mu on the self-adjoint side, and this constant alpha that I just showed you for the unitary side. And this interesting take-home message, uh, when we learn quantum mechanics, we quickly learn that addition of Hamiltonians doesn't translate nicely to multiplication of unitaries, and what's standing in the way is the big uh, Campbell baker hausdorff formula. But here, when you relate uh, the solvent joint operator to the unitary operator using the Cayley transform, then uh, the, the addition of a rank one projector translates nicely to the multiplication uh, by that uh, little operator that I showed you earlier. So the, the, the addition translates nicely to multiplication, only you need to use scalar transform. Um, and one other uh, thing that I want to tell you is now we understand better level repulsion. So level repulsion, I'll just remind you, is this old, uh, we discovered this phenomenon a long time ago. You start out with some Hamiltonian A, uh, you add another Hamiltonian B to it, and you vary the coupling constant of the Hamiltonian B, and then you look at the levels of the eigenvalues, and then you notice that generically, uh, the levels tend to not cross. They, they will approach each other, but then as they should cross, uh, they decide not to cross. So that's why it's called the phenomenon of level repulsion. Um, and we can understand this in the following way. We decompose the Hamiltonian B into a sum of projectors, and then we add the projectors one by one. 
And uh, we learned earlier that as long as they overlap between the projector and that eigenvector is not zero, there will be no double crossing. Because this is generically the case, generically we don't see level crossing. So summary so far, this was the, let's say, the math of it. I showed you that the eigenvalues move like Newton's cradle when you add a rank one projector to a self-adjoint operator. Um, you know, this is a new strategy for uh, understanding how the eigenvalues and eigenvectors change under addition of Hamiltonians. And uh, I showed you new understanding of Cauchy interlacing level repulsion. But maybe more interestingly, there are many of applications for this method. Uh, I'll talk about adiabatic quantum computing, Shannon sampling, but there are many more. Uh, basically, if there's a linear algebra, this is probably useful in some way. So uh, let's uh, get to adiabatic quantum computing. Uh, just a brief reminder of what it is. The idea of adiabatic quantum computing is to encode a problem into the ground state of a Hamiltonian. But then, every interesting problem, again, this, it turns out to be hard to find the ground state of that Hamiltonian, so you have to be clever about it. So some people, uh, found, some people uh, thought of a way to circumvent that. They said, let's, if we cannot find that ground state, let's find the ground state of a simpler Hamiltonian, and then adiabatically approach it uh, with some kind of time evolution, and then so at the finish line, we, are, uh, we have the ground state of the more complicated Hamiltonian. Um, we have to choose, however, we have to choose the, uh, the time scale at which we perform this time evolution large enough so that we don't jump from the ground state to the excited state. Okay. Um, so people have noticed that if you have a problem that's computationally complex in some standard sense, this also translates into a long computation time in adiabatic quantum computing. Uh, but it's not clear. It's not clear why does the uh, how does the computational tra complexity translate into narrowing of the gap size in the in the adiabatic quantum computing. And Newton's gradle actually gives us insight into this. What I didn't mention earlier, but it's uh, it would be obvious from the formula. What we learned from Newton's gradle is that uh, Newton's gradle is that when, when the overlap between the projector and an eigenstate is larger, then the velocity with which the eigenvalue moves as you change the coupling constant it's also, is also larger. So it turns out when the overlap between the ground state and the projector is larger than the overlap with the excited state, then, uh, then uh, the gap narrows. And the reason is that the ground state moves faster upward than the excited state. And we can see this, so you saw that, uh, you can see that the gap narrows. And so the idea here is that Newton's Gretel teaches us that when the computation of Hamiltonian penalizes the ground state more than the excited state, then the gap narrows. Which means that basically if this happens, we chose an ansatz where the final ground state is closer to one of our excited states then our ground state, so it's not a good ansatz, so better choose a better ansatz. Um, another application of this is to find a channel sampling theory. Uh, we probably all know what channel sampling theory is. It's at the heart of information theory because it shows the, shows the equivalence of discrete and continuous representations of information. Uh, but it has a flaw, let's say, not necessarily, but let's say it's a flaw. It takes an uh, infinite number of samples and it has a constant information density. But this uh, finite uh, sampling theory that I'm going to show you has, it takes a finite number of samples and you can have very information density. Uh, so very briefly, uh, please ask me uh, later, I have uh, supplementary slides. Very briefly, what we do here is we encode the samples of, our, of some function into a vector f and we encode sample points into S0, and then we use Newton's cradle to reach uh, every S on the real line between the sample points. And then we can construct the full function f of S using the samples f of S1, f of S2, and so on. So this allows us to have some kind of, uh, this allows us to have a sampling theory, which is closely related to Shannon sampling theory, but uh, it does better because it takes only a finite 
number of samples and has varying information density and there's no, uh, there's no errors in, in principle. Okay, and the, the final application I'm going to tell you about is to light matter interactions. Um, so I'm, I choose the, I chose the example of under the detector interacting with a scalar quantum field. Um, the the free Hamiltonian is very simple. Uh, it's just a number operator for the field and sigma z for the detector. Uh, the interaction Hamiltonian is the simplest you can imagine. It's just a flipping operator for the detector and the field, let's say. Um, in order to use Newton's cradle spectra, well, you need to rewrite the interaction of Hamiltonian in terms of projectors. So that's what I did here. Um, and what I used it, uh, but you can also use uh, for fun, you can use it to find out what's the dress state in light matter interactions. So the, the ground state without the interaction is just the ground state of the detector and the field. And then you add the interaction of Hamiltonian. Well, what's the new ground state? Um, the new ground state uh, involves sum over all. You can see in this formula, it involves the sum over all uh, states uh, of the free Hamiltonian. So that's uh, one periodicity um, that probably we all knew about, but this is just kind of a quick way to reach it. And uh, also, if if I give you uh, if I give you the new uh, eigenvalue for the ground state, the, the new energy of the ground state, I can quickly calculate the coupling constant G, which produces it. So um, yeah, that's a, again a quick way to achieve that. Uh, I finished the talk. Did I finish a little bit earlier? I can talk more. Yes, it's okay. We can have more questions. Okay, we can have more questions. Okay. So thank you for your attention. I'm looking for a postdoc, so please uh, email me or talk to me, etc. I have many more slides. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so questions? Uh, yeah. Can you bound the gap for the adiabatic quantum computing using this Newton's cradle method? Bound the gap. Yeah, I mean, get, you, you showed that merely that the, 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 the lowest of the gap shrinks. Yes. But uh, the main question about is how small does it get for adiabatic quantum computing? So can you put down for how small it gets? Okay, that's a good question. So actually, if you look at it, this, this is just, a, a, you can claim this already perturbed. But what's good about Newton's cradle is that it's a non-perturbative yes. result. So if the you know if the interaction you know, if the other Hamiltonian was just a rank one projector, you could fully calculate what's going on. If you want to add a full other Hamiltonian, then you can do it iteratively. So that's how you would plan to get. Out. I haven't done it, but uh, that, that's that's what you can do with this method. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now uh, it's lovely talk. Maybe fascinating. But what do you do with continuous spectrum? With continuous spectra, uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I can tell you about the. Uh, well, someone already asked about the generated states, but I haven't uh, done any work on the uh, on continuous spectra. The idea, all of this work, actually came from sampling theory, where the idea is not to have continuous spectra, but to have actually discrete spectra. So I haven't uh, done any work in that direction. Oh, thank you. Nice talk. I want to. You show the copper pair. You didn't talk about it, but I, I want to understand what did you do there? In other words, yeah. Okay, this is more of a like a curiosity. Next, next yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can tell you about this. This is more of a curiosity. Um, I talked about this in other talks. So, um, what I wanted to show here is when Leon Cooper was first calculating Cooper the Cooper pair problem. He asked uh, if he can add two electrons to a Fermi C in order to create a bound state. And then, so he created this ansatz bay function, wrote down the Hamiltonian, etc., etc. And in his calculation, at some point, he simplifies it to a, a rank one projector interactions for each uh, angular momentum sector. And then he said, oh, can I create a bound state out of this? Well, using Newton's cradle spectra, you immediately know what you need to do. You need to add mu less than zero uh, projector, and then you create a bound state. That, that was the idea of this point. That's what I wanted to ask, exactly that state, that you show the attractive force. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the anion superconductivity this way? If you have uh, not integral spins that 
they create an attractive force for you to follow it or I haven't done any work. I, I don't know, maybe. This work because if you deviate great. from index spins or half index spins, mm -hmm. that's what often you say. You create an attractive force. So I was wondering whether this method, precisely because of what you show for Cooper. Well if it's a rank one project, if you can break it off that, the of course, yeah. yes. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so I don't see any more questions. Thanks again.